Bonjour, bienvenue à tous. Merci d'être parmi nous aujourd'hui. Mon nom est Stéphane Brutus, je suis doyen de l'école de gestion Telfer. Ça me fait plaisir de vous accueillir aujourd'hui pour cette session virtuelle. So, welcome to this very first event in our Distinguished Speaker Series in Thriving Organizations and Societies. This annual lecture series provides an opportunity for students, faculty, practitioners, members of the community, Telfer Nation to learn from the world-renowned researchers as they share their ideas on important topics aim on at building meaningful organizations and societies that, that thrive. L'événement d'aujourd'hui s'inscrit dans le cadre de notre, de notre engagement à étudier les indicateurs de bonheur dans le contexte de travail canadien pour embrasser une vue d'ensemble. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce Your, uh, our two moderators for today, Professor Laurent Lapierre is Ian Telfer, Professor of Workplace Behavior and Health and Program Director of the MSc in Management at the Telfer School of Management, and Professor Sylvia Bonaccio, uh, a Professor Titulaire Ian Telfer on Psychology du Travail et des Organisations à l'École Telfer. Sylvia, Laurent, The mic is yours. Merci, Stéphane. Uh, thank you, Dean Brutus. Uh, maintenant, j'aimerais présenter notre conférencier, Sir Kerry L. Cooper. Uh, Kerry is the 50th anniversary professor of organizational psychology and health at the Alliance Manchester Business School at the University of Manchester. He's a distinguished scholar. He is the founding president of the British Academy of Management and has published no less than 250 books in the field of occupational health psychology, workplace well-being, women at work, and occupational stress. He's used his expertise to help countless organizations. Kerry was appointed commander of the Order of the British Empire for his contribution to occupational and organizational health and was knighted by the queen for services to social science. And one could say even more importantly, he is a loving family man who loves especially to dote upon his growing number of grandchildren. Without further ado, I'm going to pass it over to Kerry. Oh, thank you very much. Uh... Low. I've known Lowe for quite a long time. And in fact, we're doing a book together right now. And thank you very much, Dean, for the invitation to do this. Um, and you can hear from my accent, I'm not exactly British. Uh, I was with a name like Kerry Cooper, I would be anyway, wouldn't I? I was born actually in Hollywood, born and raised in Hollywood and came to the UK in the mid 60s and have been here ever since. I couldn't, have, as a student, I couldn't afford to go back home. So I decided to stay in the UK. No, I'm a now a dual citizen, British and American. Um, I uh, was asked by Lowe if I would do something on mental well-being in the workplace. Big topic. Big topic in Europe. Well, big topic in North America and in many countries at the moment. Um, it, it probably started about 10 years ago. So what I thought I'd do is kind of give you a, a flavor of why this is important. I'll look at the costs of lack of well-being in the workplace. Then I'll look at what, what the evidence shows about what are the factors that influence ill health at work, uh, stress at work, uh, and the opposite of that, what helps people to thrive. Then um, as a good academic, we always highlight the problems, but rarely ever come up with solutions. But no, what I'm going to do is show you a kind of strategy for dealing with this and why, it, why companies are and organizations, not just private sector companies, but public sector bodies like government departments, countries themselves are doing things in this kind of space in this arena. Okay, so the first time in the UK, I'm gonna give you some of the UK examples, but by the way, because I have all the data on that, but by the way, this is writ large in almost all developed countries, roughly the same stats throughout the whole of Europe as well. But we have the Health and Safety Commission in the UK and they publish figures every year of, of, of looking at long-term sickness absence. And in 2015 was the first time that stress and mental ill health, and you look at those two together, 
past muscular skeletal diseases as the main cause of long-term sickness absence. Real big issue. And that goes throughout the whole of most of the developed part of Western Europe, North America, and the like, figures roughly like this. So stress and mental ill health are, are the big issues of our time. So the year before uh, the pandemic is a very complicated slide, but just look at the one on the right-hand side, the circle on the right-hand side. This again came with the data the year before the pandemic hit. 57% uh, of all long-term sickness absence was for stress, depression, and anxiety. And again, musculoskeletal was 25%. And the UK government looks at well-being, by the way, Every quarter, they take about a, a quarter of a million people, 250,000, and what they do is they ask them a series of questions. They're pretty generic questions, but they ask a series of questions on people's mental well-being. And during the pandemic in May, they found that 63% of people were suffering at that point in time, again, from anxiety, depression, and stress. In the workplace, it was much higher. It was... It, it was not only the ONS survey, the Office of National Statistics survey, but other surveys were showing roughly between 70 and 75 percent, depending on which sector you're talking about. Again, even during the pandemic, we're, we're showing a high levels of stress, which you can understand given people, uh, quite a lot of people were working remotely. They were doing a lot of homeschooling. They had a lot of stress on them. Um, and therefore, and also, by the way, another important thing we have to think about is not just the pandemic. We have to think about what's following the pandemic, which is probably the worst recession in all our lifetimes. Because in the UK, workers have been furloughed by the government. That means uh, companies have been paid uh, to retain people, 80% of their salary. Now for the last 14, nearly 14 months, that comes undone, as it were, next month and the month after and by September, the 1st of September, they're going to get paid nothing. And every European country, countries have come come through and said, look, we're going to help support your employees. So we, we have another issue here uh, about the mental well-being of people as we go into a, a period of pretty intensive job insecurity. OK, this is interesting. I thought you ought to see this. And I was just talking there about long term sickness absence. But something happened in, in just before, just at the beginning of the last recession, you know, the financial crisis, when the, the top economists at the Sainsbury Center of Mental Health were looking at, hey, what are the costs of people actually turning up to work ill during the recession because they're worried about it getting on their HR records? versus them actually taking time off. Because here was the interesting thing. I was asked in the, oh God, I, uh, in the 1980s, I was asked when we had a recession then, um, I was asked the question, why is a, a, num a number of newspapers called me and said, why here are we having a recession? And um, the, the extraordinary thing is sickness absence rates are dropping. So how could they possibly be dropping? And I mentioned in the 1980s of during that recession, I said, well, if you were, if people are losing their job now due, due to this recession, wouldn't you come to work ill? Uh, you wouldn't want it to go on your record that you're off with the flu or any illness. So I said, the worry is not about absenteeism. The worry is about presenteeism. And in a way that was picked up quite dramatically by the press that we should be worried about this. Now, by the way, everybody measures presenteeism. There are lots of instruments out there. We're looking at it. But in 2007 and eight in the UK, the economists took a look at the cost of the UK economy. And we found that presenteeism was double the cost of absenteeism. And incidentally, the figures now are showing roughly the same thing. It's even higher now because we have had the 2008 recession, which has gone on and on and on. And just as that was leaving and we were, and the economies were getting better, we went into a pandemic and then we're about to go into another recession. So presenteeism is alive and kicking, unfortunately. And let's take a look at what it actually is. Okay, what do we all want in the workplace? We want people at the top there, don't we? We want people in the top left-hand box in the workplace. We want them healthy, we want them present. 
Then we have on the, the next slide, the next bit over is unhealthy and 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 present. And um, that is sickness presenteeism I was talking about. But there's also another form of presenteeism. You're healthy, but you're not always present. Your job dissatisfied. You're not interested. So, and the other one is unhealthy and not present. And that could be partly stress and the like. So we, I did a study in the UK of 39,000 employed people in a range of different occupations to see what the proportion of people were in each of those kinds of boxes. So what we found was, which is really sad for an employer's point of view, only a third of people were healthy and always present. 28% were consistently turning up to work ill. 13% were job dissatisfied. They weren't ill, but they weren't, they, they, they took time off. Any excuse, you know, leaves on the tree on a train track, any excuse not to come into work. And 24% were suffering from some form of stress or another. So it's really rather sad that only a third of people I found in the UK economy were uh, actually paying for my pension. And, and, and that's, that's crazy. Okay, there are lots of slides. I mean, this is just data. I mean, the, the, what you ought to look at is the OECD report, which they publish every year. And in the UK, for example, the OECD calculated that we're losing 4.5% of our GDP every year due to mental ill health costs in the workplace. This is a big, big issue. Anyway, there's a lot of figures on this uh, going across the globe. In Europe, in North America, the costs are the same. Biggest single cost of sickness absence, uh, of uh, presenteeism, and directly um, and potentially even to productivity. And this is where the work needs to be done, by the way, of how the mental well being of people might affect productivity, even though productivity is a very difficult thing to measure. So, you academics who are out there, uh, for those who are doing research, please think about doing stuff on productivity. We need to do that as well. So the costs are enormous. Okay, so do we know enough about what causes people to be stressed at work, to not thrive, to not be, uh, you know, make doing the added value? We do. Um, I, I was looking at some studies because I was doing a meta-analysis for the UK government, uh, Health and Safety Commission. And I found, and this was about Seven years ago, I found 25,000 very good studies globally looking at stress at work. I think we know what factors cause people to get ill at work. The issue is how do we deal with it and what works and what doesn't work. But there are factors on the left-hand side. And I'll break this down in a minute. Factors intrinsic to the job, the role you play, your relationships at work, your career development, the organizational structure and climate, um, the homework interface issues. They all affect you. And then we have individual symptoms of stress at work or lack of well-being. And then we have organizational symptoms. And people like me in Iowa psychology get called up by a professional body like the British Medical Association or some professional body and say, you know, can you can you do some work on doctors or nurses or pilots? And I've done 85 occupational groups, tens of thousands of people. We've looked at them in, in, in great detail. And basically, we're usually driven by the organizational issues. Are there more accidents driving it? Are people suing their employer more? Is there high absenteeism? And now we're getting high presenteeism as well. And the model is quite simple. The factors on the left cause the factors on the right. And diseases, these kinds of factors, the symptoms can lead to health diseases like coronary artery disease, mental ill health, or organizationally prolonged accidents and so on. And there's one box that's six foot long and goes six foot down, and that's the end of the stress process. But we're not gonna do that because what our job is in IO psychology and HR is really to identify in working populations, what are the factors that are causing the problems and coming up with solution to those problems and trying to prevent them in the future. That's our job. So let's go and take a look at some of these factors intrinsic to the job. Too much work, too little work. Every job is different, have their own kind of stress fingerprint. Uh, and I've done work, as I said, on probably 85, 90 different occupational groups, you know, from pilots to air traffic controllers and so on, uh, to a whole range of occupations, doctors, nurses, 
IT people, et cetera. Uh, but it's not just always overload. And in, in, in times like these where jobs are very insecure, we're ready, ready to go into a major recession. We just came out of a major recession. Having too little work to do can also be a stress. There's a most wonderful book you've got to read. The book, aside from my own books, of course, uh, this book is called Some Things Happened by Joseph Heller. He's the guy who wrote Catch-22. But before he wrote Catch-22, he actually worked in an insurance company for a number of years before he became an author. And this book, Something Happened, is about a guy having a stress breakdown, a mental health breakdown in the workplace. I love it because it's, although it's comical, although it's humorous, it's pretty telling as well. So take, for example, this. One of his characters in the book says, this is uh, somebody who's underloaded, doesn't have very much to do. Says, I am bored with my work very often now. Everything routine that comes in, I pass along to somebody else. This makes my boredom worse. It's a real problem to decide whether it's more boring to do something boring than to pass along everything boring that comes in to give to somebody else and have nothing to do at all. So underload can be a, a real problem area. And incidentally, factors intrinsic to jobs are uh, you know, different for different occupations. Let's take the next slide. I don't know if I, I can't remember what this next, oh yeah, just give you an example. One of the first studies I did when I started my career was looking at um, air traffic controllers at, strangely enough, at Manchester Airport. I did a big study. We did blood chemistry of all the air traffic controllers and everything else. And we found these kind of factors. These are factors intrinsic to the stress levels on air traffic controllers. I knew there was gonna be a problem with air traffic controllers when I turned up. Uh, because it was, uh, this was many, many years ago. Uh, we went, I took a PhD student and a guy was just coming off duty, one of the air traffic controllers I wanted to train my PhD student on to interview all of them and do psychometrics, do some, do some blood chemistry uh, at, at the time. And uh, the guy turns around, he had two cigarettes in his mouth. So we figured there was a bit of a stress problem in this as we we're waiting for him to be interviewed. So, I mean, every occupation is different. And this gives you a flavor of one occupation, but there are but are every. And then you have to think about what you can change and what you can't change when you're looking at things and how you're going to do it and how you're going to get ownership of the change from, for example, in this case, the air traffic controllers. Role you play, tons of research. The University of Michigan did all the studies on, on role stress that were published way back in the 1970s, looking at um, you know, looking at things like role conflict, role ambiguity, how much autonomy and control. Now we know if you look at HR, uh, HR talks a lot about this kind of issue. It, 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 it's the engagement issue. H how are you engaging your employees uh, in decision making and things like that? How much autonomy and control? Here's the irony about the uh, the pandemic. The good news about the pandemic. There's a lot of bad news about it. But the good news about the pandemic, I think, has been that for decades now, IO psychologists, HR people have been saying employees want more flexible working, not 100 percent remote like we've been doing, many of us. They want flexible working, working partly from home, partly from central office, something that suits the nature of the role, suits their family life. But. The evidence was clear, and I did a book that came out called Flexible Work. It came out in May of 2020. It was a book, an edited book from all over the globe, asking the academics in different parts of the world, look at the evidence on flexible working. Does it work? I mean, does it deliver to the bottom line? Are people more job satisfied? Are stress-related illnesses down? Is productivity up? And the answer was overwhelmingly yes. But people didn't want to take it. I did a big study in the UK of a global company based in London, but global, and a big UK government department. And we found that men said that they wanted to work flexibly, didn't take because they thought that their employers would think they're less committed if they, if they signed up for a flexible working arrangement. Women tended to take it because they're the main carers. They perceive themselves to be the main carers in terms of childcare and elder care and the like but they thought it would adversely affect their career too, but they felt obliged to, in some sense to take it on. So this is a big issue, autonomy and control. We now know that the hybrid model of working is gonna be the future. 
For those who can't be at the cold face like doctors and nurses and bus drivers and paste assembly line workers, what are we gonna see? We are going to see uh, people working substantially from home coming into the office one, two, three days a week because employers now want it because they wanna reduce the cost of their estate and they don't want downtime of commute time. So, cause this is, cause we're going into a recession and they have to save money and get higher productivity. Okay, third factor we know causes people to get ill is relationships, your boss, your clients, your colleagues, your subordinates, personality conflicts. Ask any senior manager, uh, uh, you know, what is the, if they come home from work on a particular day and they're talking to their spouse, they'll probably say, oh, I had a lousy day today. It was Fred. It was Jim. Oh, I had an HR issue like you wouldn't believe. I had conflict. I had this. This is a big issue, our relationships. Now, here is the interesting problem here. And I'll read Heller in a minute. But here's what I think the big issue we have in the future. And business schools, in my view, have not dealt with this. And here's what we haven't dealt with, and society generally, is we tend to select uh, and pr promote and recruit people for managerial roles based on their technical skills, not their people skills. We only nod in the direction of their people skills by doing a psychometric test, but we don't basically promote them. We look at the bottom line and here's our, and here's our problem. We saw it during this pandemic. In Europe and North America, a lot of people were working substantially from home, right? More than ever before, we needed bosses who had good people skills, good EQ, good emotional intelligence. And we didn't have it. And they had to learn it. They had to learn. Well, you, we had to tell them, here's what you have to do. Because so many people had good technical skills, but not good people skills. So what we had to do is we had to say, what you need to do is to your direct reports is you need to uh, get in touch with them individually, uh, you know, via Zoom or whatever during this pandemic. Uh, uh, to talk about the issues. Are they, are they coping? Uh, how's everything going on? Because they weren't in the office. So we realized that. So how do you team build in the future when we have hybrid working? We need people with EQ. How are you going to recognize when people aren't coping? If the leading cause of sickness absence is mental ill health, how are you going to recognize it when people aren't going to be in the office that much? The boss is the fundamental thing. Unless we do that, then we have to have on the door of every office building like we have on a packet of cigarettes, your boss is potentially dangerous to your health. So our challenge, and business schools, by the way, not many anywhere actually do experiential training with their MBA students to try to develop their interpersonal skills, their people skills, their emotional skills. What we do is cognitive input. We tell them about HR, we tell them about marketing, we tell them about e economics. It's cognitive. It is not behavioral. And until we change this and there's parity between people's, the, the, uh, an individual manager's people skills and their technical skills, we're going to be in trouble. So what we have to do is take this into account in recruiting and promoting people in the future. I love this from Heller, by the way. Heller found in, in the work he did when he was working in an insurance company, he found people problems were the major problem. Listen to the opening two paragraphs. It's funny, but it but it's really moving. In the office, in, this is the opening paragraph of his book, Something's Happened. In the office in which I work, there are five people of who I am afraid. And each of these five people is afraid of four people, excluding overlaps, for a total of 20. And each of these 20 people is afraid of six people, making a total of 120 people who are feared by at least one person. In my department, there are six people who are afraid of me. And one small secretary is not afraid of all. I mean, one small secretary is afraid of all of us. I have one other person working for me who's not afraid of anyone, not even me, and I'd fire him quickly, but I'm afraid of him. The thought occurs to me often there must be mail clerks, assistants, messengers of all kinds of ages who are afraid of everyone in the company. And there is one uh, uh, secretary in our department is going crazy slowly, has all of us afraid of her. Her name is Martha. Our biggest fear is she'll go crazy on a weekday between nine to five. We hope she'll go crazy on a weekend when we aren't with her. Now it's humorous, but to be honest with you, it's about relationships, how important they really are. And in the future, even more so. So this becomes quite important. The boss, the manager, business schools have a challenge. HR departments have a challenge. 
and and HR departments are going to have to start to really learn how to recruit people properly uh, for the for the roles they're going to play in the future. Next slide. Career development again. We having here the problem we're going to have is lack of job security. That's going to rear its ugly head in the coming year, and we all know that because we know what's going to happen. Because if an organization in the future has to uh, downsize to be competitive, it's going to lose people, and uh, this is going to be a big issue that we're going to have to manage. Uh, next slide. This happened, by the way. The next slide will show you what happened during the recession. The Chartered Management Institute in the UK, it's a professional body that of all the managers at all levels. And you can see during the financial crisis, the economists there took a look at this and the psychologists, and you could see from September 2008, near the beginning of the, of the recession to two years later, big changes in job satis dissatisfaction, I'm sorry, job security dropped dramatically. And we're gonna get that. We're already seeing it, by the way, the ONS survey, a lot of surveys in Europe now by the EU are finding job security levels are very, very low as people are about to enter the recession. So how we manage that requires a different kind of line manager. We better, we better be thoughtful now when we recruit or promote people to this role as we go into the next few years of, of a really changing work rate, hybrid working, uh, job insecurity, um, and AI, uh, artificial intelligence, and managing that process. You think about the things that are going to hit us over the next year. Phenomenal. It's great for us in IO psychology and HR. It's an opportunity because this pandemic has rebooted the workplace. So this, uh, I found this in uh, Buffalo News. I like this because this is uh, this is what happened. This is a cartoon that was in during the last recession of 2008. The bad news, Johnson, is you're being let go, says the boss. The good news, you can have your old job back at after your former pay. I can't live on that, says the employee. The rest of the good news is we can offer you a second job, also at half your former pay. At the bottom, it said, I'd offer you a third, but I'm afraid of overheating the economy. Joke, but interesting. So organization structure and climate, important. How do we communicate? Uh, what kind of a climate do we have? What kind of an organization? And we're, what companies are now doing is are really into the well-being arena. Why are they into the well-being arena? Why is mental well-being at work now big time? It's not just a large um, amount of, of long-term sickness absence or presenteeism. It's not just about that. What companies across the globe are worried about is the next generations, i.e. the Z generational and the millennials. How do we retain them? Because if you know the, the, the terminology that has been identified globally in every damn newspaper you can read when you're talking about the millennials is they call them the snowflakes, the snowflake generation. In other words, they go into a workplace, they don't like it and they bloody leave. Okay, now their parents didn't. Their parents put up their fathers, their mothers who worked, who worked in, in environments they didn't like that were, didn't give people autonomy and control, didn't let them work flexibly if they wanted to, was a command and control culture. They just stayed. This generation are not staying. I get students from my MBA coming back to me and they say, I say, how you been, Fred? How you, what you doing? Are you still with X? Oh no, you're kidding. I left X. That's a lousy company to work for. Why would anybody work? Yeah, they pay well. Yes, they're high status. Why would you want to work for them? They don't let you work flexibly. They have a long hours culture, just burn you out. I don't need it. I want a quality of life. I want to work hard, but I want a quality of life. So that's what we have to look out for. Next slide, please. Uh, and homework interface is really big time. Uh, but now we're getting it, aren't we? The pandemic has sh shown that we have homework integration. That's what we're into now, right? We're integrating our home and our work life. Our place of work is changing. Uh, the quality of the space in work is going to have to change. Um, and that's going to be interesting too, because if you want people to come into a central office for team building and doing things more than, uh, than just one day a week and maybe, maybe two or three, you better change the, uh, the, the, the environment that you've created there. You know, it, it's not going to be, it's not, a, a, it's in most organizations, not particularly very pleasant at all. And so 
we have to think about this and work life integration is begin is happened during the pandemic and it's going to take place and it's going to be out there now forget about balance it's about integration and how we live our lives and use technology finally using technology rather than going into a central office environment an hour to get in an hour and a half to get home at night exhausted working long hours like you get in north america like you get in the uk like you get in many countries now it, it's not good for our economies it's not good for the health of our people so what do we do about this okay uh, this is a strategy I came up with when I was working with the EU, the European Foundation for the Improvement of Living and Working Conditions. It's one of their major agencies. It's based in uh, just outside of Dublin. And they asked me to come up with a strategy for dealing with stress. Oh, this was years ago and dealing with well-being and trying to enhance well-being. And it's a primary, secondary and tertiary strategy. The tertiary is, do you have counseling services around to help people, EAPs? Secondary is, do you train people to cope better, prioritize their work, resilience training, could be any kind of training. Uh, and then primary means, what are you doing to find out about employee voice? How are you finding out how employees perceive your organization and then trying to create a more strategic uh, well-being strategy? Uh, here's our problem in this regard. In the whole area of organizational well-being, the problem is companies are doing the following. They're doing all the low-hanging fruit. They're doing mindfulness at lunch. They're having um, uh, mental health first aiders. They're doing, uh, you know, uh, the well-being day. They're doing sushi at your desk and bean bags and ping pong tables and all that and all that kind of stuff. That's low-hanging fruit. Enjoyable. I love it. Massage me at my desk. That's fine. Give me sushi at my desk. That's great. I don't mind mindfulness. I quite enjoy that. But that is not a well-being strategy. And the problem we have is unless we do primary and find out what employees, how they perceive the organization, and based on that, create a strategy at the senior level, I mean at board level. In the UK, the good news is a lot of the big companies, not the SMEs, unfortunately, and not all big companies, but about 40% of companies now see this as a strategic issue, and they'll have somebody call a director of health and well-being. Two, two years ago, I was called up by an American company who headhunts for CEOs in North America, mainly the U.S. They called me up and said, this is two years ago. We've had a dozen people come to us, a dozen companies come to us saying they want a, a chief well-being officer, and we don't know what that looks like. So what's a CWO? Do you know, Professor Cooper? I said, well, we're beginning to get them here, but we don't call them that here. We call them directors of health and well-being. And here, in some companies, they report to the HR director, some to the, uh, the, uh, the uh, chief medical officer, and in some, directly to the CEO. But now companies, too small a number, too small a number, are making this strategic and making it a board issue or an SLT issue, senior, senior leadership team issue. And it should be, and somebody should be responsible for that. It shouldn't just be one of the things HR does. Somebody has to have direct responsibility and can go directly to the CEO. We have to make this strategic now if we're to get rid of the mental health epidemic, minimize it, and also be more productive in a massive international recession. And if we don't do this, and the ones who do it, they'll be competitive, they'll survive, the ones who don't won't they won't retain people they'll burn them out and particularly the younger ones who are your future our future is the z generation of millennials that's all our future they're the only ones who are going to make up money to pay my my pensions and everybody else's pensions so it's really important we do this next slide please does this work do these strategies work the cipd i'm president of in the uk we have 100 and nearly 160,000 HR professionals. It's the Chartered Institute of Personnel Development. It's in the UK, Ireland, the Middle East, uh, Singapore. It's, it's, going, it's going more and more global, but it started with UK and Ireland. And we, have, we do this report every year. The, 2000, the 2020 one has just come out a few weeks ago. I didn't have a slide on it, but it's, rough. it's even better. 
but still 60% of organizations do not have a strategy in this. All they do is well-being days and well-being champions and, and mindfulness at lunch. But it does affect sickness absence rates. It does affect morale and engagement. And if you look at the PWC results, it affects, this is based on 55 companies. Again, this is global stuff. Look at it. It affects the bottom line. So are we going to do this or not? And that's what we have to do. So I'll just give you one example. But there's a big company in the UK, a big, a big construction company, very big. It's quasi-governmental. We found that looking at, we took two and a half thousand people, 2,600 people in, in 2014. Just to give you an example of it. In a large, it's a public sector, private, it's difficult to explain. It's an unusual type of company. But we found there was a 0.46 uh, relationship between enhanced well-being and productivity. We're, and by the way, in this particular organization, you can measure physically productivity. Next slide. Okay. You can see high and low people on such like as well-being. And we came up with a formula. Okay. I have a university spinoff company called Robertson Cooper. And we came up with a formula to try to find out uh, what they actually saved, if anything, by doing the well-being intervention. We found that we saved 1,201 pounds for each individual by just training up 15% of their workforce. Next slide, please. And then if we looked at just the sample we have, but then took it a little bit higher proportion, we found it saved 468,000 pounds, et cetera. And you can see we saved 6.1 million just in one year doing one intervention. These are pounds, so that's pretty heavy. If we did this only in the whole of the UK workforce and only did it for 15% of people, we'd save 5.6 billion pounds, which would be, next one, which would pay the wages of 243,000 nurses, or you could buy 21,500 Lamborghinis if you're so indulged. And, and last slide, this is what well-being is not. Tomorrow is the mandatory meeting on employee health and well-being. The meeting starts at 6 a.m., so it'll interfere with your sleep and not your work, says the boss. Doesn't that sound a message that work is more important than health? I hope so. Healthy employees are unproductive. They're always exercising or eating fruit when they should be eating. We prefer employees who work hard and die before their pensions pay off. Suddenly I feel sick, says employees, right on schedule. That is not what this is about. And can I then finish my talk and just say, well-being is now front stage. Enhancing the health and well-being people is not a nice to have, but a must have, given the new changing nature of work, given the recession, given the challenges to be competitive and produce to the bottom line. So it is, it is fundamental, but it's not a concept that's new. Listen to this. There was a speech given by the, the greatest president the United States never had, Bobby Kennedy. When he was running for the Democratic nomination uh, 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 for president, two weeks before he died, before he was assassinated, unfortunately, in my hometown of LA, he gave a speech at the University of Kansas and he called that speech gross national well-being. Incidentally, only one country in the world now has that. I think uh, New Zealand is thinking about having it. New Zealand doesn't measure GDP. It does measure GDP, but it's only a subset of a larger measure, which is called gross national well-being. I think New Zealand is also thinking about doing it. Many countries are thinking about it now. Are we measuring the right thing when we measure the success of our country? Is the success of our country just our GDP? or in the old, and during Bobby Kennedy days was GNP. Everything we produce, everything we manufacture, everything we build, everything we construct, everything we produce, services and everything. Listen to what he said in his speech. I'm not gonna read the whole speech, but you'll love this bit. Too much and for too long, we seem to have surrendered personal excellence and community values in the mere accumulation of, in the mere accumulation of material things. Our gross national product in the United States is $800 billion a year. But that no gross national product, if we judge the United States of America by that, that gross national product counts air pollution and cigarette advertising and production and ambulances to clear our highways of carnage. 
It counts special locks for our doors and the jails for the people who break them. It counts the destruction of the redwood, the chopping down of trees, and the loss of our natural wonder in the chaotic sprawl of our cities. And this remembers Vietnam. This is 1968. It counts the napalm bomb production and counts nuclear warheads and armored cars for police for people, for the police to fight the riots in our street. Yes, the gr yet the gross national product does not allow for the health of our children, the quality of their education, or the joy of their play. It does not include the beauty of our poetry, or the strength of our marriages, or the intelligence of our public debate, or even the integrity of our public officials, Trump. It measures neither our wit nor our courage, neither our wisdom nor our learning, neither our compassion nor our devotion to our country. It measures everything in short, except that which makes life worthwhile. Powerful speech by Bobby Kennedy. So he was talking about well-being back then. We haven't learned our lesson. Maybe this pandemic and maybe this recession will force us to think differently, will force our businesses to do what they often say. The most valuable resource we have is our human resource, but rarely action it. Our business schools to think about how we ensure we train people on their emotional intelligence, as well as their technical skills in marketing, ops management, and economics. So we have a future and the future is rosy in a way because the pandemic has accelerated something that many people in HR and occupational, uh, occupational health and organization psychology have been saying for years. So thank you very much. Many thanks, Carrie. That was, uh, that was great. Um, so Sylvia and I would like to share with you some questions from the audience. Um, I will um, start this, uh, actually Sylvia is going to start it off. Um, so Sylvia, I'll pass it over to you. Sure, thanks Lo. Uh, so the first question that came during the talk uh, was whether uh, you could share a few more words about the role hierarchical cultures play in people's stress and uh, conversely, their well-being? Well, that's an interesting question because I think there is something in that. We, all our organizations are pyramidal, right? Okay, here's the problem we have. And it's linked to the line manager, by the way, because I've said that line managers from shop floor to top floor need more EQ. Okay, so you're a very good social worker or teacher or engineer, really good at it. But to get more money and to get more status, you have to go up, you have to climb the greasy pole. You have to go up the hierarchy because that's the way it's functioning. So I think what we really need in the future is not pyramidal organization structures, but boxes where a really good engineer can get almost the same salary as a CEO for being a top engineer without having to do a managerial job. A really good nurse doesn't have to become a nurse manager. I think one, I think we have to rethink that. That's going to take a while, by the way. But I think there is something in that. Because why I think we tend to get people who get promoted on their technical skills is be, they don't necessarily want to be a manager role, but that's, the, that's how you get promotion. That's how you get more money. That's how you get higher up the system and get recognized. Not you're not recognized. You know you do a great job as a as an engineer, and and the organization say you're such a good engineer. You just we want you doing the job you're doing. You're doing such a great job. We're going to give you an extra twenty thousand, right? Not that you have to go for the engineering manager job to get the twenty thousand. Somehow we got this wrong, and maybe this will give us an opportunity to rethink this. But there is something about hierarchies. I agree, Sylvia. Thanks, Carrie. Um, the um, I wonder if something related to that, because I'm not sure what the intended meaning of hierarchical culture was. That certainly is one way of understanding the term, but perhaps we can also talk about a country's hierarchical culture, like very vertical cultures in countries, very autocratic. 
Uh, is that yeah. something that uh, that you can speak to? Well, I mean, look at I think command and control cultures, whether they're political or organizational, are not healthy for us. I don't see how they how how they can be healthy for us. For you, human beings are delivering two objectives, whether they're in a government department or in an organization. And I think management style is quite fundamental. I think we've just developed a, I'm already, I'm gonna get in trouble for saying what I'm about to say, but I think we've been too much influenced by American management style, which is have a nice day, but with a, with a, a iron fist in a glove. I, I just, I, I think most management styles that we have seen have not been really participative. And and I think American uh, management styles, particularly US, I think have influenced the world um, and probably too much. Maybe we have to roll back from that. And I see, I see changes it within the US in that regard as well. Uh, and, uh, any, and beginning to happen in Europe too. Uh, everybody's taking into account now the line manager much more than they ever have before. But uh, politically, I think the same thing applies, you know. Thanks, Gary. Uh, the next question is, what are two or three things that managers can do or not uh, to help reduce the likelihood of exacerbating mental health issues for staff? Okay. Uh, one, engage your employees. Uh on a one-to-one -one basis. I mean, in the future, what we need to do is we need to have line managers from shop floor to top floor, not only having team meetings, but also doing one-to-ones much more directly with people on issues to do with them as people. How have you coped? By the way, that happened a lot in this pandemic because lots of people like myself, tons of occupational psychologists and HR people were saying to all their managers um, in, in uh, in conferences and everywhere, please get in touch with your direct reports about how are they coping. So doing that, being able to recognize when people aren't coping, looking at the symptoms of them not being able to cope, not trying to be a counselor yourself, but getting help for people who need it, being a good listener, caring, supporting them, whether it's through EAPs or whatever way they need help, uh, and, and mean it, and just mean it. The difficulty, I think, is the managers, you know, if they don't have these skills, I call it the 50, 30, 20 dilemma. And what I mean by that is I think that roughly 30% of people who get into managerial roles have the natural people skills, the EQ, the social interpersonal um, skills to do their job naturally as human beings. 50% have great technical skills, could be trained in terms of people skills and are trainable. And therefore you provide and give them the kind of training they need. And I think there are 20% who shouldn't be left near people that they have, they don't, they are untrainable, but technically very good and should be put in a technical role and rewarded, but not put near people. I hate saying the negative bit, but I think there is, and we have to accept the reality of it. But, but to do it, don't work people long hours, Manage them by praise or reward rather than fault finding. Listen to them, support them, find out what's going on in their lives and their and their families' lives. That was happening during this pandemic, and good. That's the good part of it. Sylvia, you're muted. Thank you. It had to happen once in the seminar. Don't worry. It always happens. So the next question that also came through the chat um, was as follows. Um, I thought it was interesting how much, how too much and too little of something can create stress. Too much work, too little work, under promotion, over promotion, and so on. If reducing stress relies on such balance, which I assume can be very different for everyone, how do organizations effectively create such balance? How do they create it? How do they? How do the organizations, or how does the manager? Or leaders. It? Well, I think it's leaders. I think leaders at all levels have to recognize when people are not being stimulated enough, or being have uh, you know unre uh, 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 unmanageable workloads. 
come on, that's this goes back to EQ again. If you're a really good line manager, what do you do? You recognize when people have unmanageable workloads. You can see by their body language or what they tell you because you they because you listen to them or watch them and see that they're not coping, that their behavior in a meeting is when they're usually very buoyant, they're no longer buoyant, they're so socially withdrawn, or they're more aggressive than they used to be. You look for the behavioral signs and you can see whether people are overloaded or indeed even underloaded, because underload means you don't kind of value them. I did a study once of international interpreters in Geneva. It's a, an organization called IEC. They're the, 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 the cream of the crop of international interpreters who work for the EU, the UN, globally. They're the top, the people with five, six languages. They're brilliant. And I did a stress study of all of them for the, I was commissioned by the, the, the organization to do it in Geneva. And we found that those people felt that they weren't treated. So they would be in a setting like in the UN or this was many years ago, or the, in an EU meeting, you know, with all these global leaders all there having this four or five day meeting. Nobody engaged them. Nobody, nobody made them feel, they felt underloaded that all they were doing was interpreting. And yet they wanted to feel part of what they were doing in a sense. They wanted to be acknowledged. And um, that made them, and the other thing we found is quite a lot of them had lots of PhD, had PhDs in a variety of different languages. Did you really need somebody with that kind of skill base? Did you, could you have thought of it differently because these were really intelligent people and maybe you, you, you needed, maybe something is slightly different um, in recruitment, needed a different kind of uh, recruitment strategy and so on. I've seen it in my career. There are people who are not utilized enough and that can cause stress um, as, as well as being overloaded. So underloaded is, is, is an issue just as overloaded is. Thanks, Gary. Um, another question, because uh, the issue of the importance of the line manager has come out loud and clear, uh, not only in your talk, but in a, in a number of, uh, of outlets. Um, in your mind, how do we influence the leadership or people in, in formal positions of authority to change their behavior so that wellness is at the forefront of their role as managers? Okay, you know what I what I would suggest. This is very interesting. You should ask that question because the the change that's taken place in the UK in the area of well being has taken place because people have actually spoken out. It's not necessarily the data which shows this is really costly for UK business. What has happened is that the uh, leaders like Antonio Hororia, who was CEO of Lloyd's Bank global bank, right? He came out and said, you know, I'm suffering depression. I'm taking some time out, right? Somebody at Barclays Bank, I think deputy chairman, I can't remember, very, very top role guy said the same. Uh, the current chief executive of BP has had depression all his life and he's just been appointed at last year. And he talks about it openly and, and by opening up yourself, hey, do you think people at the top of organizations are immune from stress? Well, quite the opposite. That many of them get divorced. They have problems with kids. They have because of the life they lead. They have their own personal problems. Da, da. We all do. You know, nobody's immune from this. And yet, the more they speak up, the more it changes behavior. So senior people acknowledging their own, in a sense, weaknesses. And you think, oh, my goodness, you can't do that. Certainly politicians can't do that. And yet the Norwegian prime minister about 20 years ago went on national television and said, I have depression, I have, I'm, I'm taking some time off. And he, then he got reelected when he came back. So you open by your, you yourself being open, whether it's at the top or anywhere in the system, you yourself being open will open other people to talk about the issues they have and will reduce the mental health stigma that we still see, even though we act like it's been dealt with. It hasn't been dealt with yet, not truly. Well, thank you for this answer. 
Um, the next one is a, a segue, um, also came in through the chat, uh, and it's a paper that was published this weekend in a journal that you know very well, Carrie, your journal, the Journal of Organizational Behavior. Um, and the study links work stress and lack of support to workers dying by suicide. Uh, and if you could share your thoughts of what organizations and managers at all levels can do to help in this area. Yeah, well, by the way, we had that issue. We knew about that in, in Japan, didn't we? The Japanese have a word called karyoshi, which is death by overwork, the people committing suicide. We've known that for quite a long time. Uh, incidentally, was also another study showing long hours, wasn't it? Done by WHO, was it? Uh, 750,000 people across, across the globe, they say, died of working too long hours. Uh, very interesting. Um, and uh, of heart attacks and strokes and things like that. Um, anyway, no, I, I, I think we, I mean, suicide rates are low in most countries anyway. Uh, in Japan, it was extremely high at one time. And by the way, I think it is still reasonably high. Um, that's only one manifestation of, of uh, stress at work, but heart disease, uh, immune system failures where your, your immune system is suppressed and you end up getting cancers. That's another one. There's a lot of research now being done on cancer. Look at it. So let's create healthier workplaces. You don't create healthy workplaces by having a long hours culture. You don't create it by having bottom line managers who are only in, you know, have you read your contract? Um, you know, get on with it, command and control type people. That that won't work either. That'll just get a mill, who uh, give people unmanageable workloads, unrealistic deadlines, all of that. Uh, you manage people by praise and reward. You create the right kind of culture. You'll get the you'll get the output you need. Yes, people in any case might still get ill because there may be factors in their private life that affect them. Sure, but you help them through it. You help them through it. You show your commitment to them. They then show their commitment to you. That's what that's what we all have to do, and we have to we have to work toward this. It's not just a, I think the whole idea of workplace well-being is no longer just a really a nice to have. It really is going to be fundamental to the organizations that are going to be successful. And there's more and more evidence showing that. And the more researchers do work on this to see what the impact of good work is the better for all of us. Thanks, Gary. Um, another question uh, is, um, is as follows. If we see, quote unquote, work well-being as a goal, as opposed to a consequence of a healthy organizational culture, could there be a danger that this goal will be taken as manipulation, meaning uh, the boss may think, I need to focus on well-being so my employees will be more productive. Well, I mean, you have to be genuine, don't you, in the end? Because if you're going to have a strategy, so what does a strategy in well-being mean? So <clears throat> there's a company that my university spinoff company works with. The CEO and his particular team, the construction company in Europe, okay? We go quarterly. We say everything we're doing. And they're bottom line. Like, what's wrong with them being bottom line? Hey, we don't, this is not fuzzy stuff anymore. We want people to actually be healthy and deliver, right? And the healthier they are, the more they're going to deliver. We go there and we'll say, uh, and we have a, a, a number of year, a few year contract with them. And we say things like, here was an issue that employees raised and we did following. We then collected the data on the intervention. It didn't work. Okay, so we're going to tweet it and we're going to do this. Now it works. So they're happy because it's delivering to the bottom line. The employees are happy because they they got what they wanted because they had employee voice on it. And I think the point I'm trying to make make is it has to be genuine. The people that have to have to, at the top have to believe that actually treating people well actually is important. If they think about their own kids, would I like my kid to be in this organ? If everybody thought, if every line manager thought to themselves, no matter where they were in the organization, 
Would I like my kid to be treated the way I'm treating my employees? And we just thought that for one minute, I think our, our whole workforce would change. And we, we have to do that. And it's not manipulative, it's, it, it does deliver to the bottom. We have to look at, look at, there's no point in doing stuff, make everybody happy, happy, but it delivers no, and the business goes out of, it goes bust and everybody's unemployed, right? You have to do what, there has to be a psychological contract between employee and employer that this is for everybody's benefit. Okay, uh, so the next question came to us in French and it's going to require us to shine a, a light on the employee experience or the work experience. So please let me share the question in French first and then I'll translate. So the question was, Comment faire pour garder le moral quand on doit investir beaucoup d'heures pour le travail maintenant que nous travaillons à la maison? So, how can workers keep their morale up when they're working so many hours, balancing work and family, and now that they are working from home? Yeah, I agree. It is is difficult. And you know what you're having to do in this in the scenario we're in at the moment is we're having to tell people that, well, it's even more complicated than that because of course what we've had, I don't know about whether you've had this in, in, in Canada or not, but we've had homeschooling for many, many months. So we've had not only people working 100% from home, but that's not what people want. They want flexible working, partly from home, partly from a central office, probably substantially from home, but going in one, two, three days a week when it's necessary to team build, to schmooze, to uh, develop a new product or service, et cetera, et cetera. And what I think you, what we needed to do in this kind of context, I think is to, is to tell people that they cannot work, they should not work long hours. They have to find a routine. I guess that happened in Canada. HR must have done that. HR departments in the UK were saying to people, clock off. Do not do presenteeism. By the way, presenteeism took place during the the the, uh, the pandemic. People were sending emails late at night. They were doing all sorts of things. And you know why? Because they were feeling job insecure. They were either being furloughed or feeling that they could lose their job once the pandemic was under control. And therefore, we're trying to show their commitment by sending emails early, late at weekends, et cetera. And that's not what we needed. And that's... and and. Uh, so managers, again, the good ones recognize that was going on. And I know lots of senior people were saying, we're going back to their employees and saying, hey, I don't want to receive emails at 10 o'clock at night from you. I want you to be with your family. That's the good guys, right? The other ones just let it ride. Let's get the most we can out of this resource. And that's not the good ones. Thanks, Kerry. Uh, the next question is uh, speaks to the last one, is related to the last one. Uh, with the degrading boundaries of work, non-work, um, through flexible work arrangements, what strategies should be recommended for individuals and managers to maintain boundaries and or thrive in a world of constant connectivity? Okay, yeah, I, I agree with that. It's a, it's a very good question. So we have two good examples, all right? I'll give you two examples of the good and the bad, okay? I don't know if you heard, you probably heard this in Canada, about four or five weeks ago, the CEO of a major investment bank who said nobody will be able to work from home. You all have to come in. We all know that. By the way, my students then went and said, I'm not gonna go work for that organization. And some of them were thinking of it, okay? So they're gonna lose people, right? That's a bad strategy because that's not employee voice, that's imposition, all right? Okay, another organization, I'll name it, PwC, decided what they were gonna do, at least in the UK and Europe, they were gonna talk to each employee, figure out the role they played, what they wanted to do given the nature of the role and the demands on, uh, on the job itself and coming up with an idiosyncratic way of dealing with it. That's the way you do it. That is the way you do it. You talk to each employee and so employee says, look it, I'd like to, I live, you know, my commute's an hour and a half into London. 
You're right. And an hour and a half back. That's three hours a day. I'd like to come in because I, I have I, I, I have social needs. I want to meet my colleagues. I want to team build. I want to be with them. But what I'm going to do, what I'd like to do is just trust me. I'll come in when I need to come in. But I don't want to do it five days a week anymore. It's it's burning me out. I don't want to do it. And guess what? I'm more productive. And look at I'm saving you three hours a day. Right. I'm saving you three hours a day. I have three extra hours to work a day. So let's get this right. And 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 there's one extreme. The one extreme that I mentioned is not the way to go. And that's just old fashioned, out of date, not not fit for the Z or millennials. Because there's no voice given to employees at all. Because there's no voice. It's about employee voice. Come on, what is HR about if it's not about that? It's not about, you know, hiring and firing and rations. And it's not about that. It's not about, HR should be human resource management, which should be getting employee voice. That's what we should be doing and listening to them. And sure, and but you have, it's a psychological contract again. I mean, people can't demand something that's unrealistic given the role they're playing. So our next question is for the managers, the line managers who find themselves stuck in the middle. So what is a line manager to do if their direct supervisor cares very little for employees' well-being? And how can that line manager protect their own subordinates? That's a very good question. And I'm afraid we're going to get a lot of that because we're going to get different line managers up and down the system, the hierarchy. Some of them are going to be au fait with what we need to do and some who will uh, prevent it. That's why I think if it was me and I worked in a comp and I worked in a, in a company, what I would do is I, the first thing I would do given where we're going now and what we've learned from the pandemic about the need for these social interpersonal skills and everything else, I would do an audit of every damn line manager. And you know what? HR knows the goodies from the baddies. They know the people who are dysfunctional when it comes to manager a managerial role and those who are very constructive i would i would start doing that almost immediately because that's how you'll change it in the long run look at everybody you've got and figure out which ones need training which ones don't need training and which ones just are untrainable and need a a, a technical role but get them out of a managerial role i i'd start that way uh, but you know what? Every line manager can create the right culture for their employees. And even though it may conflict with what their boss wants, that boss's line, you know, line manager themselves, they can still create that niche. But unless that guy, man or woman interferes, and then you have a problem. But you know what? That's HR's role. HR's role is to sort this out and create the right kind of culture. HR is more into this than they ever have been, by the way. My experience working across Europe is HR is changing, changing dramatically. I wonder if the same is going on on this side of the pond. Well, the U.S. has never been particularly good at this thing. A few minutes. All right, it's my wife just saying to me, are you, are, can you let me in? <laughs> I'll do that in a few minutes. She'll go in the garden. It's okay. Okay, so let me follow follow up with uh, with another question. Okay. Um, the question is as follows: Thank you for great data validating the urgency of psychological well being in organizations worldwide. Did you obtain more specific data on why organizations of all types, decades after this type of information has been available, are still not turning this knowledge into practice on a bigger scale? That's a really good question. I think that. I think where we, where we probably failed, people in IO psychology and HR failed, is in looking at what the impact this, this has on the bottom line. This is the productivity issue. I think we should have collected more data on that. And I think if we did, and now we have. So in other words, what we did is we said, a lot of our studies were showing that it's important to manage stress because it makes people more job satisfied, et cetera, et cetera. And we began to collect data at the, at the, at the margins. We'd collect data on its impact on sickness absence and factors like that. 
probably what we didn't really do, and I hope future researchers do do, is see what impact it has on objective bottom line measures like productivity. Does it help? Does, it, does, does this all mean something? The evidence is beginning to mount now on the bottom line issues, not just the sickness absence rates. And remember, uh, sickness absence rates are not that great a measure in the sense that people are still frightened of going off ill, the presenteeism number. So uh, I think there's scope here for research to show, and, 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 and that research is now being done. My, my university, Manchester Business School, just got a massive government grant to uh, create a, from the UK government, to create a productivity institute. One stream of that productivity institute, and they have people from all over the country involved in this, from all the other universities involved, Manchester's, Manchester Business School is the head of it for the UK government to do this. And what one stream of it is about well-being, how well-being leads to productivity. So our next question, um, it's a little bit longer and it has two parts, uh, so let me read it. Um, I wondered your thoughts on mental and physical health for financially insecure workers. So those are not the workers in managerial or profession professional level jobs. And if the initiatives should differ for those workers, given the links between financial insecurity and health, it seems that these effects would be stronger, especially now considering the pandemic. And then the second part of the question is, there's also gender effects to consider in that women are more likely to be working in low wage jobs and therefore be in conditions of financial insecurity. Now, the, the, any well-being strategy should take all workers into account, not just managers. This is not managerial. And most of the companies that I've worked with, global, large-scale companies, are looking at everybody from shop floor to top floor. They're all involved in it. And the working parties that are set up within companies have representatives from the unions, from management, all over looking at this as an issue. That's the only way to do it. If this cannot be, this not, cannot be managerially led in the sense that it's just for white collar professional staff. It's got to be for everybody. And that, that's what's happening. And that's, the, that's what it, it's, a, it's a global strategy. This construction company that, that I was talking about earlier, they have done something really interesting because what they've done is you look at a construction company, there's a main con, um, contractor building a football stadium or whatever, a railway line or whatever. Um, and they have subcontractors, right? So the company itself may be 10,000 people, but they employ 100,000 people by subcontracting. This company has decided the blue collar workers, the guys, the guys the, and men and women at the coalface are the ones that need to be engaged because it, you, can, you can do everything for your team, your, your 10,000, but the 100,000 are building it. You don't do something for the blue collar workers, you're dead. So they, they, have, they have, are delegating it down. They're developing well-being strategies and helping to fund it with, the, with their subcontractors. Now that's very clever. That's the kind of thing. But any company that has blue collar all the way, it's everybody. A strategy should be for everybody, not just for managerial people. Well-being isn't a managerial issue. Indeed, this is quite interesting. The UK, the year before COVID hit, Okay, we're, we, we have a big construction industry here. And in the UK, two years ago, the evidence was this, 45 people died on a construction site from an accident. Try this on, 450 construction workers committed suicide. So mental health has become a big issue even, even in the very macho industry of the construction industry. Here's another one that um, that underlines a, a gender difference. Uh, since the pandemic, there's been an exodus of women leaving the workplace in order to care for their families. How can we create workplaces that empower women to continue the important work that they do 
and develop while still allowing them the flexibility to be the caregivers. I assume this <laughs> assumes that women are the primary caregivers, which is not necessarily the case, but I'll, I'll let you answer that. Well, I think they probably are. I mean, I think, you know, there is a new man, I think, in Canada somewhere, but I think he's touring the country at the moment. No, I think in all countries, I think I think we have we have a problem there. I think there's a difference there between, uh, uh, say, blue women in blue collar jobs during managerial. Managerial jobs, given the flexibility and technology, they can do you. They they can still be employed and have have do the caring of the family and all the rest. There's no problem. It's the blue collar workers who have to be at the coal face. I think it's more problems. How do we do? How do we allow that to happen? But there again, it depends on the circumstance. Can you make it feasible? Is there a way of doing it, given the nature of the job they do? Okay, maybe they don't work full time, but they work part time. Maybe they work certain shifts. You know, you 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 come up. You know, the best thing to do is you ask the employees themselves. You go into an organization and you say to your employees, "Here's a problem we have. The problem you just faced me with, Low. That's a problem that could be put to the employees." What do you think? How can we solve this problem? You women who have in a blue collar job want to want to juggle everything. You want to do your family, but you don't know how the hell you're going to do it. You're not white collar. So you, it's not technology is not helping you. You need some other solution. What do you think the solution is? Employee voice again. What do they come up? I, I know in the research work I do, when we find something with the stats and the and we, when we do the uh, well-being audits using proper psychometrics, I always tell the employees, here's what we found. What's the solution? Don't expect it to come from me and my colleagues. You tell me what it is. You know better than me. You know the coalface. And they come up with novel things I wouldn't even have thought of. They don't come up with solutions like, well, we need more nurses. You know, the, the nurses will say we're overloaded. And then you'd think they'd say, well, we need more, more nurses. And they might say, we need more nurse managers to help us prioritize our workload. They come up with solutions you don't think about because you're not at the coalface with them. All right, thank you. I think this is our last question looking okay. at the time. Um, so this question is uh, as follows. How can people leading startups or other entrepreneurial organizations balance the need to fully dedicate themselves to grow their business with limited resources, including people, uh, and not uh, experience burnout? Well, that's, a, that's a really hard one. I, I know, Sylvia, because I started a University of Manchester spinoff company in 1999 in the well-being space. And it was really hard doing it. But as an academic, as a professor of organizational psychology and health, I felt I should try a business. And another colleague of mine, Professor Ivan Roberts, and I created a business. And we could have burned ourselves out, but we did it slowly. We didn't, we tried to adhere to the rules. So for example, our key staff are an EMI scheme where we give them shares from the company and the university gives them shares from the company because the university is the major shareholder. Uh, you don't have to burn out. I think the problem with SMEs and particularly entrepreneurs is they work too many hours and they do burn themselves out and they have to get the balance right. Otherwise they won't be successful because they'll get ill. And we've seen examples of that a lot in the particularly small end of the SME thing. So managing your own lifestyle is quite critical at that point because you're the boss. And if you're the boss, you have to make sure you all spend time with your family. You have the social support systems in place. You consistently work long hours because you're fearful of getting the business. You'll lose the business, but you'll lose your health as well. Well, that's uh, great. We have so many questions that are still coming in through the chat. Uh, and we uh, might have time to sneak in one last question. Lo, can you... Pick one and see. I'd be happy to. Give me one moment. Yeah. I'm quickly reading. It's okay.
<laughs> what does the research say concerning mental health and well-being among academics? Uh, and do you have any advice to academic leadership in terms of managing well, so the, the well-being of that population? Oh, my God. Yeah, that's a big one. I did uh, my university spinoff company, by the way, and myself separately as a research project for the, uh, the, the, the government, the higher education fund. I did a study of 14 universities in the UK, all staff, academics and everything else. What surprised me is how high the stress levels were among academics. I thought it was going to be much more among uh, the white collar staff, if you know what I mean. I mean, the secretaries, uh, the people working in labs, but it wasn't. The academics were worse than that. I think when, I'm, I'm not sure we do it right. And I think North America is quite different from Europe. In Europe, people get into those roles, managerial roles, uh, because of what we call it here, Buggins turn in the UK. That means you're, I was the head of a, a, a management school, a big management school, because I had to do it for three years. That was my job. You have to do it, right? It's slightly different in North America and that you point a dean, and dean is usually much more au fait with managerial issues. Heads of departments don't tend to be. They tend to take jobs in the UK and Europe. You know, they do it short term and everything else. I think we need proper managers, frankly, and certainly training. That's the one thing we don't do where universities are really, really bad. They think they know it all. We all think we know everything, particularly, damn it, a business school. Oh yeah, we know, yeah, we're in a management school, we're a business school. But I think academics are, the public sector isn't terribly good in, in management, uh, managing human beings very well. I don't think it, it does the training that you'd get, you'd get more of in the private sector. Thanks, Sylvia. Uh, Kerry, thank you so, so much for having given us uh, some of your time uh, today. Uh, you raised, and actually thanks to the questions as well, um, audience members uh, raised uh, a number of important issues. Um, some of those include the fundamental importance of making well-being of strategic importance across all types of organizations. Uh, also, the importance of, uh, especially for researchers, of looking at, well, what exactly is the tie between well-being uh, and productivity uh, in the hopes that um, establishing those ties will help ensure that well-being is even more at the forefront of, of leaders' minds. Um, the, uh, you also underscored the importance of having managers, line managers throughout the organization who have the interpersonal skills. The, uh, you, you mentioned the emotional intelligence uh, to lead and to therefore be cognizant uh, of their employees' well-being and what to do when they notice that uh, people are not, their people are not exactly doing so well. And there's a number of, of business schools, uh, one example being our own, the Telfer School of Management, that offers executive leadership programs uh, that actually explicitly targets those kinds of skills. So I would hope that uh, this will go on the rise, that this type of attention given to emotional intelligence, or if you will, social uh, interpersonal skills amongst organizational leaders will, will increase in terms of business training. Uh, so uh, I would like to thank not only Sir Kerry, but also uh, our audience for participating. Um, and um, on that note, uh, we will bring this to a close. Thank you, Lo. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.